Welcome to the COVID conference. What can we expect and what can we do? As you know, Canadians are less and less concerned about the COVID virus and the pandemic. The lack of interest is mainly because sanitary restrictions are almost over and the return to pre-pandemic lifestyle. But also, inflation, Ukrainian war, and more negative news have shifted public's attention. However, the virus remains active and can mutate. Death rate among unvaccinated populations is still high, and there is also side effects such as lung COVID, stress, and more. Countries with no health restriction for the past two months are facing a rapid growth in COVID. La Chapitre for Saint-Jean and RMC Alumni Association made this conference to remind us that it's not over yet. We need to stay alert, to keep a positive attitude, and protect our costly gains. We need to adapt our living to a new reality. I am André Pronovo, member of the Board of Directors of Le Chapitre Fort Saint-Jean. Our team has prepared this conference to allow public to take a journey into the past, present, and future of COVID. Our panelists, Dr. Mathieu Simon, pulmonologist and intensivist, head of intensive care, Heart and Lung University Institute at Quebec, and also Associate Professor at University of Laval. Dr. Marc Dauphin, retired military doctor, was commander of a military hospital in Kandahar and practiced in several other hospitals, including CF Bilar, Germany. He also has given several conferences on post-trauma. By answering questions from the audience, the two panelists will help us better understand and answer questions such as, what we know about the virus, the variants, and the therapies? What we hope from our health system, research, and society behavior? What we can do to be more responsible, share risk, and better manage our health? Thank you, André. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here with uh, Mathieu and uh, Dr. Simon. Um, Will remind us that although we're all watching what is happening in Ukraine right now, uh, the COVID is still there. It hasn't been uh, beaten and it's still around and it's still uh, hitting people hard. Um, one of the things a lot of people want to know, uh, Dr. Simon, is what is a virus and, and, and how is the COVID virus different from the other ones? A great question, Dr. Dauphin. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you allow me first, uh, this is the beginning of this webinar, for those of you who are listening live, uh, I just want to acknowledge that's International Women's Day and I want to salute all the, the women who serve in the force and all the women who gave their child to serve in the force uh, all over the place, all over the world and in all these eras. Um, I want to also, uh, Dr. Dauphin, to convey my warm thanks to the Canadian militaries who uh, were uh, incredibly useful, compassionate, and dedicated helping in managing this pandemic that was uh, a crisis of uh, an, an unbelievable scope. Uh, the army was professional, prepared, benevolent, and they did for the Canadian people more than many other group of, uh, of workers. So thank you. I salute your engagement. I salute your courage. Uh, we will need that. And we need that as a role model in our society, which is looking uh, strange by the day. Um, also, um, we have been discussing liberty. That's a, that's a word that has been um, a little bit use maybe too too many too much over the course of the past two years uh you paid the price of for liberty 
you give us peace, you give us, or society, the sacrifice of yourself and your predecessors is uh, a debt that we Canadian citizens have toward, toward you. And I, I encourage you and salute you uh, for your, your engagement. It's, it's fantastic. So it's a great pleasure for me to be, to be here, Dr. Dauphin, and uh, to try to, to answer these questions. Uh, COVID, you're right, is not going away uh, anytime soon. Uh, we are just out of the fifth wave, uh, a wave that has been tremendous by the, share, share, the, the simple bulk of the, the patients that we receive in hospital and the population that was affected. Viruses are uh, in the 1960s, in fact. We were not sure that they were alive. Uh, we were not sure that they were a living organism. Um, in fact, uh, a virus is a capsule containing genetic information and the only goal of a virus is to find a suitable host where it will be able to multiply by using the, uh, the, 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 the machines, the cellular machinery that is capable of synthesizing or cells or proteins. So a virus has no gain in killing his host. In fact, COVID-19 killing human being is a, is a nonsense. And that's why we have seen the COVID evolve. It was a, a bat pathogen in the beginning of uh, its, uh, its, uh, its existence. Uh, first isolated in the coal uh, mine in China, about a thousand kilometers from Wuhan, the city where it was first isolated in human. Um, one study uh, published uh, two days ago from the University of Arizona has finally put to rest the conspirationist theory that the uh, virus escaped from a uh, Chinese viral virus laboratory. Uh, it was traced down to, uh, to bats that were served as a delicacy at the market. And that's how the, the COVID-19 uh, skipped one species to another. And that was us. Um, the COVID has evolved from the alpha, was associated with a very high mortality, uh, thrombosis, and uh, infl inflammation of the lungs uh, to the Om Omicron, which is the current dominant uh, variant. Uh, this variant is associated with an 100 fold less risk of dying or being hospitalized. But because it's four to six times more contagious than the original alpha or delta, it resulted in a, in a wave of a, of a a size that where we were not prepared for. Well, in fact, no society can prepare for such. Uh, in English uh, and in uh, the army, you call a saturation attack. Uh, that's the all our defenses, medical defenses, were saturated by the amount of incoming uh, viral particle, and that's why our systems were so so weak and so uh, outclass. But we are fixing that, and later on in the seminar, we will discuss how we can prepare for the, the next wave, because there will be another COVID-19. Maybe not COVID-19, it will be COVID-32, it will be influenza, it will be something else. But we have to stand prepared. So what you're saying is that the virus absolutely needs some cells to reproduce. Otherwise, it, it's just there, it's just inert. And so um, 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 what you're also saying is that the virus that kills the ho its, its own host is very stupid because its goal is to uh, uh, procreate and last and, and, and uh, reproduce forever. So um, can, does that mean that we're going to see the, 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 the lethality of COVID going down as time comes as time goes by? Obviously, it's, uh, it's, it's already coming down with the Omicron uh, variant. And you may have heard of the stealth Omicron, which is the next variant of interest for the OMS. Uh, in fact, it's uh, very close to Omicron. It's a little bit more contagious, but it's not more lethal. Uh, the pandemic will become more lethal because viruses will mutate into more contagious but less severe uh, vectors. And at the same time, we will build a, a, an immunity, a community immunity, and we will develop medications and way to care for patients affected by the virus 
that will mitigate the lethality of the virus. Of course, some people want to predict apocalypse and they believe that the Omicron could mutate back to a more lethal version of Omicron, which the same lethality and the same contagiosity as Delta. It's of course possible. Uh, if the 24 last months taught us something, it's that nothing is predictable. Uh, but I, I don't believe that uh, to be a, a real concern at this moment. Hopefully, it will not become a concern. Okay, that sounds that sounds reassuring. Um, I know that Jill Carleton has a, a question uh, to ask you, uh, Dr. Simon. Uh, can we have Jill on, please? Hi, my name is Jill Carleton, and I am the chair of the Royal Military Colleges of Canada Alumni Association. I am asking my question from Smiths Falls, Ontario. Like many C Canadians, COVID has become very personal for me. I lost my father to COVID the week before vaccinations became available in Ontario. So my question is, is the current vaccination sufficient to create collective immunity? How long does the vaccination protection last? And what will happen if more variants arrive? Will it protect us against those variants? Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and uh, I share your loss. Uh, very sad for your father. Um, well, the current vaccines, whatever vaccine you, you receive or will receive at, uh, with the current technology, will um, calibrate their response on the S protein, the spike protein. And this protein is also the one that is mutating from variant to another. So uh, the virus is, we are collectively immune uh, to the Delta, to the Alpha and close to the, the Omicron now because the vaccines are effective and over 85% of all Canadians receive it. Uh, the, the, yeah, <laughs> exactly. What is the duration of this immunity that the vaccine will confer to us? We don't know yet because we have not reached that moment. In fact, we have been facing viruses that mutate faster than the immunity induced by the vaccine wash out. Uh, in fact, if Delta will, uh, remained the, the, the most prevalent vi uh, virus, we would not have had a fifth wave and we would be back to normal life by the, by the time we are. What Omicron brings to the table is that because it's so contagious, we estimate that half of the Canadian population has encountered and has had an infection due to Omicron over the course of the past three months. And when you contract an infection with a virus, you are not only immune to the spike protein, you're immune to all the proteins contained in the envelope and in the uh, genetic code of this uh, th this virus. So it provides you with a much more robust uh, protection against next the next variants or uh, other infections. So I'm almost pleased and uh, quote unquote, um, that the, 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 the Omicron was able to vaccinate those who didn't want to be vaccinated by inducing them uh, with, an, with an infection that was not too severe, much more, much more difficult to, to bear than the simple act of vaccination, but that was their choice. And people who were vaccinated against the Delta, they had a lesser form of infection and they reboosted their immunity, providing us with, I hope, uh, many months of... Uh, of peace with regards to the, uh, to the pandemics. But once again, Jill, if uh, a highly mutated variant was to, was to develop, uh, I cannot presume what kind of protection we will have. It will be partial at least, but I think that we have seen uh, the worst of it. That's good news. Um, I see that uh, Bob Ben has a, a question for you, Dr. Simon. Hello, Bob. Hi, Dr. Simon. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Ben. I'm uh, talking to you from beautiful uh, Saint Jean, so it is the Quebec. And I'd like to know what other therapies are available to prevent the disease or minimize its effects. 
Good question, Bob. And uh, the science is still uh, is still writing the the book at this time. Um, we the first medication that we had to mitigate the effect of the virus were corticosteroids, the uh, good old decadron, prednisone, and things like that. They seem to be very effective in preventing severe disease, preventing re requiring for intubation and supplementary oxygen, and preventing death. Um, we also uh, test and uh, use other immunomodulator. The, the most common of them were blockers of the interleukin-6, uh, the tocilizumab, which was uh, used uh, at in very large amounts uh, during the past uh, the past year, and we have other monoclonal antibodies uh, directed against interleukin and other receptors associated with the inflammatory pathways that have been used with success in preventing death, hospitalization, and uh, other bad outcomes. What can we do to prevent the infection? That is uh, more complicated. Vaccination social distancing, washing of the hand, wearing of a mask, ventilation in a closed space, that's all the, the best way to, to prevent the, 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 the inoculation of the virus. Once you have been inoculated, what can we do for you to mitigate the risk of catching the real disease? Well, we have drugs, both IV and uh, by mouth, uh, you have heard of the Pax COVID, which was developed by uh, by uh, Pfizer uh, a few months ago. These uh, these drugs are developed from the HIV drugs uh, that we have been using for the past twenty years, and they interfere with the hijacking of the natural body mechanism by the the virus. They are very toxic, they are associated with many side effects, and they don't go well with most of the medication that you may have been prescribed for other conditions that you have. That's why they have not been used uh, widely. Canada, the US, uh, most, most Western countries acquired tons of these, uh, these medications, and in fact, they are not used very widely because of the the, the difficulties the, in, their, uh, in their logistics and the side effects that they have. But it's one brick in the wall that we are building around and against uh, COVID. That's interesting. Um, um, and I suppose we'll have more and more as time goes on. Yes. Um, yes. Um, the, the research is very active in that field. And once again, the idea is not to protect us against this COVID, it's to gain experience and protect us against the next wave or the next viral pathogen that we will encounter because they all use the same general pathways. So by having COVID, we are, we are preparing for the future. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I know that um, uh, in my career, I was an, an ER doc and uh, I spent some time too in the ICU. Um, um, I know that you guys have had a heck of a ride these last two years. Um, um, what, what lessons have we learned and what do we hope uh, will happen in our health systems um, and, and social behavior too? Some people seem to have been rather almost uh, psychopathic or, or, or uh, against society, you know, sociopaths. Um, as regards to um, um, the virus. So what have we learned from that? And, and where do we hope we're going, Dr. Simon? How many hours do we have to answer that question? <laughs> 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 well, uh, Dr. Dauphin, as you know, in the army, logistic is the most important thing in time of war. And against COVID, we were at war. You remember that we were... Uh, having some shortage in uh, protect, personal protective equipment, yeah. we, and that was not well publicized for good reason, we were lacking some essential medications and we had to, uh, to work very hard to secure uh, provision for these medications that were sought after by every country at the same time. Uh, you remember the episode of the empty 
Antonov landing at uh, at Montreal with supposedly uh, a shipment of masks that was empty. Um, that's the kind of uh, of guerrilla that we've seen that was that has never been seen in a medical emergency, and that tells you a lot about the scope. The the medical system has to to work better and to communicate better. During the pandemics, we were able to discuss directly with the Ministry of Health, and that this discussion was both sides. So we gave information from the field, and they uh, took decisions uh, with the, uh, the the correct picture of the field, and that was something that we have not seen in uh, in the Ministry of Health forever. We changed things at a pace that were that we were not used to changing something, and you know you're you're part of a of a huge machine, and you know how huge machines uh, feed on paper and red yeah. tape. So we 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 took a we took a hit uh, in the, in the paper and in the red tape uh, issue. So I think that we are more readily prepared to face. Uh, any contingency now and we have to carry on the, the worst thing that could happen is that we see things going back to normal and that we migrate from preparedness to laziness and laziness will in the end be the, the, the or, or this, this demise uh, clearly um, so uh, I think that we, we learn lessons we, we have assembled teams that will be the, uh, the, 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 the the people on the wall watching for the enemy coming. We have teams all over the world with the uh, yeah. health, uh, the, the, woo, the, the woo, collecting samples of everything to make sure that variants or other viruses are not active in the animal, uh, in any animal species. And we are erecting walls in between these species and ourselves. But obviously, the problem will not be in the Western world. It will be in place where animals are infringed in their territory by growing agriculture or logging. And obviously, it will put the human race in contact with viruses that they were not supposed to meet. And that's exactly what happened with COVID. Yes, unfortunately, yes. Uh, you know, you get close to animals, but this is the price you pay. Um, 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 I think we have a question by uh, Monsieur Charles Cormier, please. Just one sec. Good evening, Mr. Cormier. Hi, uh, Charles Cormier. I'm uh, chair of fundraising with the Fondation des Anciens of CMR, and I'm also an aviation consultant. So I do have concerns that are triggered by my aviation background. If anybody's traveled lately, they, they wear a mask from the moment you enter the terminal to the other end and then the airplane is quite uncomfortable. But now that we've, we've, uh, we've heard for political reasons and people are just fed up that masking, masking is, uh, is going to be relaxed what sanitary measures should we maintain and, and still respect? And what are the symptoms that we could anticipate if we don't mask? What should we do? Excellent question, Mr. Cormier. Uh, yeah. In fact, with the, uh, the, the mandates on mask and other uh, measures uh, expiring in the next uh, few uh, hours to uh, weeks, and depending on where you are in Canada, some are already gone. Uh, we transpose the COVID responsibility to the individuals. And that's a great thing because everyone will be responsible for himself, but everybody has to remind that he is also responsible for all the community. Because by wearing a mask, we, we speak about the usual procedural mask uh, that was distributed wi uh, widely you basically protect essentially the ones you are with not yourself because yes the mask will filtrate some of the the aerosols that could be uh, in the room but the mask is active in preventing your own aerosols to 
to, to, to clear them out and to infect other people around you. So wearing a mask is both to protect yourself, but mostly to protect the community. So I think that what we'll see uh, in the next few, few years is an evolving uh, societal ethique. I think that it will not be appropriate to, uh, to cough at the, at the grocery store or any public venue without a mask, without protecting your face, without doing that Absolutely. in a tissue at least. Uh, spitting on the ground will not be uh, that, uh, that sexy. Um, uh, I think that washing your hands when you enter a public space, uh, public space with contact. I'm very happy that the lady in front of me in the avocado bin has washed her hands before testing all the avocados before making her choice and me waiting for her to, to clear the place to pick up my own avocado. I'm very happy that uh, there is some soap available at the, end, uh, at the entrance of the grocery store. Um, so uh, uh, going to work, going in public when you have a coriza, a flu, a runny nose, a fever, it will not be appropriate. So um, employers and employees will be more, um, more apt to work from home or from elsewhere without putting to, at risk their environment. One thing that I'm very sad of is an initiative that was taken in, uh, in the province of Quebec last week. A group of immunocompromised patients decided to uh, print out a, a little sticker that they will put on their mask to specify that they wear a mask despite the expiration of the mandate because they are immunocompromised. And they have this only, only because they don't want to be harassed by people fed up with the sanitary measures that may in, try to intimidate them for their coreness uh, in the quote-unquote again. This is not socially what we want. Uh, and I think that if someone wants to wear a mask for something else than to rob a grocery store, you should be allowed to wear a mask, whatever is, is conditioned. Uh, and once again, you wear the mask for yourself, but you mostly wear it for your community. So I hope that we will see an era of tolerance and of liberty. We have, we have tolerated a lot of personal liberty expression. Wearing a mask is one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your intervention on this subject. Um, uh, people should be allowed to do what they want to without being harassed by uh, sociopaths or whatever they are, um, anti-social individuals. Um, I would uh, have a question from um, uh, Mr. John McManus, please. Um, Hello, Mr. McManus. Yeah. Good evening. Hello. Good, good evening, Dr. Simon. Uh, my name is John McManus. I live in Victoria, British Columbia. I'm the past president of the uh, RMC Club of Canada. And uh, as a retired military swimmer, I volunteer to coach at the uh, local uh, base, the Squimalt Pool. We're, we're reopening now. And uh, one of the th questions that I have for you, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier about the health departments uh, communicating. Our, our health department here in BC was very good at telling us what we can't do during the COVID period. But now that we've reopened, um, the swimmers all look to me and uh, want to know what they can do. And uh, it just seems like there's not a lot of communication that comes out as to how to transition to the uh, new situation. I just could I wonder about having your comments on that. Well, it's a good question, Mr. McManus. Um, you see, we... We live in the post-traumatic syndrome uh, of the Alpha and the Delta, who the, the viruses which killed uh, thousands of fellow Canadians. And of course, the people in charge of making these, uh, these back to normal uh, discussions and directives, they are afraid of being wrong. And I can understand them. I work with them and they spend the night thinking about, am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Am I uh, hurting my economy? Am, am I uh, hurting my, my population mental health, uh, physical health, the education of the, the kids? So they are uh, 
in fact, very cautious because they don't want to be wrong. Um, I think that it's in the next few few weeks we'll see, uh, with for better knowledge of Omicron, with the incident that is going down, with the non-appearance of new variant of interest. Okay, we have talked about the uh, the new or stealth Omicron, the B.02. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, very different from Omicron. So it's associated with a mild disease. We are partially, but partially significantly protected by the virus. So I think that your your swimmers will be able to re-enter the water without wearing a mask, which is a good thing when you're in water, as long as they uh, respect the new etiquette. Uh, it's not a, it's not appropriate for a, a swimmer, an athlete, or anyone else involved in sports or whatever social activity to join the club, join the pool, if you are carrying a viral disease. So if you have fever, if you're coughing, if you have a runny nose, well, stay at home. Uh, and for the others on the team, don't pressure the, the guy and the girl who wants to stay at home because he wants to protect the team. To come on because uh, we we want to play, um, and of course this perception will be uh, will be shared unequally among the population. Uh, I made a, a very strange comparison, but I think it's worth consider viral infection of your ENT sphere as having diarrhea. If you have diarrhea, will you go to the pool to play water polo with the team? I don't think so. So if you have a runny nose, you should behave as if you had diarrhea because it's communicative and it's not very happily ap spread. I think that's uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, and basically it's just your responsibility to try not to infect others if you are infected. Um, I, I'd like to know, I'd like to hear what you think about, um, um, uh, about long COVID. There's an article that came out uh, recently talking about the virus attacking um, uh, gray matter in, in the brain. And then we have a lot of uh, uh, reports about myocarditis and blood clots and, and such things like that. Is the virus um, uh, one that likes, uh, the, the, you were talking the other day about uh, muscle and the the, uh, the junction between nerves and the muscle. Is the virus uh, um, uh, a guy, uh, an organism that likes uh, uh, nerve cells or muscle cells? Or can you tell us more about that, please? Well, it's interesting. You. You see, uh, look, the the ACE receptor where the virus yes. locked in the in the body is very widespread, and depending on the first place of infection or the spread of the infection, you may have myocarditis, encephalitis, blood clots. The virus will replicate at a rate that will uh, trigger the inflammation cascade, producing diffuse inflammation in your body, which is, as you said, attacking possibly the brain, the, the muscle, the cardiac muscle, the peripheral muscles, the peripheral nerves. And what we call nowadays long COVID is, uh, is a millimelo of all these, uh, these problems. And it's not well defined because it is not well definable. Uh, depending on where the inflammation struck, and this is possibly depending on your own genetic code, because depending on your <laughs> genetic code, you encode more or less receptor in every organ. So let's say that you, Mark, have encoded a lot of ACE receptor in your lungs. Well, you will get a very bad pneumonia. If my receptors are mostly located in my nose, I may, I may uh, go anosmic of, for the from the infection and stay uh, uh, nose blind for the rest of my life. I don't know. Uh, we're, we're not sure of what is long COVID at this time. And long COVID is mixed up with these remnant inflammatory problem, but also with all the other disease that were not addressed during the pandemics because people had 
difficulty seeing medical attention. Uh, some people will have a, a stroke, a heart attack, a cancer, and they will blame it on long COVID. And this is not long COVID. This is only something that you have not addressed because you were not able to see your physician or you were afraid to go to the hospital for your screening, which is an epidemic at this point. We, we see diseases that we have not seen for eons because people were not, uh, were not in, uh, due, in due time addressed by the medical system for many reasons, most of it being fear of contracting COVID or being tested. Yeah. And the other things, and we alluded to that earlier, uh, the, the stress uh, that we have experienced over the past two years, which is only renewed by what is happening in Ukraine, by the inflation, by all the other problems that are popping up at the time that we should be celebrating. Instead, we are fighting in Ukraine and we are paying more at the pump. Uh, so that cuts short the celebration. Uh, so this has been a marathon for people that lose, lost their job, lost their social bearings, lost their friends, lost part of their family, sometimes due to the disease or other problems. So these are difficult times. And long COVID should not become uh, a 13 bin, uh, bin for all the strange things that happens in your body. Please seek medical attention and make sure that this is only long COVID because we are having tre uh, treatment for long COVID that are coming to the market and uh, we, we are promising. But please just make sure that you don't have another disease that COVID that causes your symptoms and that we can treat readily. Very important. Thank you very much. Very, very important. If you have symptoms, even if you've had COVID, please consult your uh, family physician and uh, and uh, get uh, get the appropriate testing done. Um, there's a, um, um, I mean, you guys in the ICU, you've seen that um, right away, as soon as it started, we've seen that obese people were not doing well with the, the COVID. I mean, that's easy to understand. I mean, ventilating some, uh, an obese person is, 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 uh, I was glad when I intubated an obese person to send them up to ICU so that you guys would have the problem because it's, it's very difficult. Now, um, there's another uh, um, condition, pre-existing condition, that um, did not fare well um, uh, with uh, COVID, and that was diabetes. Diabetes, um, um, type 1 diabetes mostly, I think. Um, um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, that's a good question, but I have no answers. Okay, that's good. Uh, type 1 diabetes are quite rare compared to type 2, of course. Yeah. Type 2 are often, most often uh, associated with obesity. And obesity is the, the fat that you have in your fatty tissue is the source of all the inflammatory mediators. So the white cells will start to process the fat that you have accumulated and produce inflammatory mediators that will render you sick after the infection. And so we think that by having a bigger reservoir of raw material for inflammation, obese people uh, had a, a worse time with COVID and by far it was the worst uh, predictive factor of bad evolution. Uh, and that's on top of everything that you said, more difficult to intubate, more difficult to gain, uh, to gain vascular access. Etc. Etc. Less mobilization, also, also with stress ulcer and things like that. For the diabetic, uh, diabetes and ACE receptors are inter interrelated, and as you know, we use anti ACE receptor blockade to help diabetes to prevent their uh, the, the deterioration of their renal function. We don't know yet how it works, but Clearly, a virus that will attach to the body by the ACE receptor has something to do with the effect of ACE on diabetes. We think so. It's a, at, at least it's generating a lot of research questions and hypotheses. And maybe that in a few years from now, I will be able to answer your question. But for tonight, that's, that's the amount of speculation that I'm willing to go. That's good. Um, um, I have uh, here George Lundy, who has a question for us now. 
Hi, my name is George Lundy. I am vice chair of the Royal Military College's Alumni Association, and I'm calling from the South Shore of Montreal. My, my question um, relates to the sharing of risk and responsibilities. Specifically, how are these risks and responsibilities shared between the government and us, the public? Thank you. Great question, and uh, I think that you are more qualified as uh, as a warrior as I am to to answer that. But I will try to to do my part. And Mark, maybe that you you should comment on that too by from your past experience in the military zone and uh, advanced post. Uh, in fact, government action is required when the population has not enough knowledge to make the appropriate choices. Uh, you've seen very aggressive uh, measures, the confinement, the uh, couvre-feu, uh, curf curfew, um, all the, the closing of all public venues. That were required because we were uh, experiencing with the Alpha, with the, the Delta, with, uh, with all the other in between, a very transmissible disease with uh, one in 10 chance of getting you to the hospital and one in three chance when you are in the hospital to get you to the ICU. The, we have spoken about the resources that were a little bit uh, scarce, uh, but in fact, we don't want to send Canadians to the ICU, not because we don't want our bed to be full, we just want to not to lose Canadians to a disease that we can prevent. Uh, everyone has put the emphasis on protecting the health system. That, there is no point at protecting the health system. We're protecting the population, and the health system is part of the system designed to protect the population. So uh, I think that in time of crisis, it's very important that we have top-down decisions that will make sure that the, the 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 population will not be in charge of making decisions but only follow the orders and that's what is happening in any crisis now we are in a scenario of exciting ex exiting the crisis and you see the population being more and more involved and engaged in making their own choices we'll see less and less restrictions. And I don't see these restrictions coming back unless we have a more potent variant, another yeah. virus, or a, another crisis because the, the, the incidence of the, the disease is either get, going up or the prognosis is getting worse. Uh, because as, you, uh, as you've seen over the past few months with the, the truckers, the manifest, uh, the truckers uh, in Ottawa, the capacity of everyone to make the right choice and the logical choices is a little bit overestimated from time to time because by by getting together on the on parliamentary ill they were just postponing the resolution of the pandemic because they were interacting non-vaccinated without mask without the the distanciation and in fact they were exactly uh, doing the reverse of what they should have done um, uh, I'm not sure that this was this is was this was uh, well advised. I can understand that everyone is fed up. Uh, I've spent most of the the years the, back to the two the the last two years in, in my office and in my unit, and I would like to spend uh, to have a stroll on uh, Parliament Hill. It's a beautiful place when the tulips are on, but uh, not to to share my uh, my, my viruses. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon. And we have a last question from uh, Carolyn, please. Good evening. Hi, my name is uh, Carolyn Hug, and thank you very much for taking the time to share all this information with the with us. I'm currently my pleasure, Carolyn. I'm currently the president of the Chapter Fort Saint Jean, and I'm retired from the military. I was a military police officer, and my thank daughter you for your service. Thank you. And, and my happy daughter, Women's Day. <laughs> and to top it all off, I have a daughter who is currently serving within the Canadian Armed Forces and has just returned from uh, the Ukraine deployment. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. um, my question this evening is, um, what does it mean 
to live with the virus? Is it possible? Is it all possible in a pandemic or in an ed endemic? Sorry, I don't think I pronounced that quite well. <laughs> well, some viruses, Caroline, we cannot live with. Um, in fact, the, the, the smallpox that was a militarized vaccine uh, that supposedly exists only in the few laboratory, research laboratories nowadays, you cannot live with that. Uh, because it's it's spread by no not by uh, by aerosols it's spread by the air so it uh, it can uh, it can contaminate everyone in a, in a, in a, in, a, in the room in a, in a matter of few seconds that's what that's why it was considered a good weaponized virus which is not a good thing um, the omicron that we have now is not close to the lethality or the contagiosity of uh, of smallpox viruses and so we can live with a virus with a few with a few um prerequisite 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 Ooh, that's a difficult word at this hour of the day uh so the virus has to be not lethal on most of uh, most of the, the the patient it will infect it has to be preventable by sanitary measures and by vaccinations, measures that will not be applied by everyone, vaccinations that will not be taken by everyone. The more the virus is, is, is transmissible, the more people vaccinated or immune by infection has to be in the population to have a core immunity. And we have to assume as a society that we individually have a role to play in living with the virus respecting the others wearing a mask when you are uh, forced to get out of of your house uh, but having uh, symptoms staying at home when you don't we when you you have upper respiratory uh, infection um and being benevolent in uh, in making your decision, taking of your liberty, but also uh, the protection of the the ones that you you should care for, and the the problem that we have in the equation of living with the virus is not the virus. The virus nowadays is probably manageable with simple individual appropriate measures and the vaccinations that we have for most of us embraced. Uh, the problem is in this growing sense of individuality of the population, uh, sense a sentiment that has been growing for the past, I don't know, five to 10 years at least. Uh, it's difficult because in the past, we were led by people we trust. Was it, was it a general, a prime minister, uh, a clergyman? someone in uh, in whom we invested our confidence and nowadays and in part because we have been disappointed by some of these lead by some of these leaders um everyone is his own leader and so to convey the idea of social responsibility to people who have been over the past years much more inclined to consider their own liberty and rights it's the part of equation that I'm not sure of. Will we be able to convince almost everyone that we have a share duty to the living with the virus uh, plan? I hope so. Uh, I hope so, but it will, it will depend. If the virus is not worse than Omicron, I think that we will succeed. But if it's more contagious or more dangerous, with two years of... Uh, emotions low, ru running high or low i'm not sure uh it, it will be difficult and we we need good leadership we need the population to stay informed to stay concerned and to understand that no one knows but we have to make a decision in the best interest of everyone even if it's not fit for everyone dr simon Chief of uh, Intensive Care Unit at the uh, um, Heart and Lung uh, uh, Center in Quebec City. I thank you very much. I also thank you for your last two years of work. I know how I know what it is to work in, in the ICU. It is exhausting. 
and it is many, many, many decisions, many emotions too. And uh, so I thank you very much, you and your colleagues, for what you have done. I also thank uh, all my uh, um, uh, veteran friends for this for their service. I'd like to thank those who are still serving um, uh, for their service. Please uh, uh, stay uh, uh, stay healthy. And uh, um, I guess that about wraps it up. Mathieu, do you have any more questions or things to say? Well, uh, well, no, um, I was thinking about what I was going to say. Well, Mark, thank you very much to you, to your team. I think that that was a very, very good experience to work with you. Uh, and as you were saying, uh, I think that the healthcare system and the, 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 the armed force share the same dedication to people that we want to defend from uh, from others, being virus, being enemy of the state, being natural catastrophe. And I think that the world, to paraphrase Barack Obama, the world need more people from the armed force, not to wage war, but to carry the spirit of being on this planet to help others and to, to make sacrifice because you have a purpose. And I cannot, uh, I'm seeing what is happening in Ukraine. I know that you have people all over the world protecting our liberties. And there are people from the armed forces of, from other countries that are doing the same. Um, uh, I, I'm deeply in debt uh, to, to your service, you the veterans, you the current enlisted, and maybe you also the, the cadets and other students at the, the college. Uh, thank you for your uh, your dedication. You give me hope in uh, in our PC, and I think that we have to find a way to put back in focus the notions of public service, uh, as opposed to um, individual liberties. Uh, get me right. I have nothing against liberties. Nothing against. I I'm an apostle of tolerance and. Uh, doing uh, whatever you want in life as long as it doesn't uh, jeopardize the the society as we know it so thank you for guarding our liberties thank you for permitting us to live in a free world uh, with some sort of civilization and i just hope for the best where with the, the difficult months we have ahead with everything that is happening um, thank you thank you very much and uh, good luck